but broken promises, unfair treatment, and outright exploitation from abroad have also exerted a heavy toll on our ability to progress. Given this long history, if this year's theme is to mean anything at all, it must mean something special and particular to Africa. In the aftermath of the Second World War, nations gather in an attempt to rebuild their war-torn societies. A few global system was born, and this great body, the United Nations, was established as a symbol and protector of the aspiration and the finest ideas of humankind. Nations saw that it was in their own interest to help others exceed the rubbles and wasteland of war. Reliable and significant assistance allowed countries emaciated by war to grow into a strong and productive society. The period was a high watermark for trust in global institutions and the belief that humanity had learned the necessary lessons to move forward in global solidarity and harmony. Today, for several decades, Africa has been asking for the same level of political commitment and devotion of resource that described the Marshall Plan. We realize that underlying conditions and causes of economic challenges facing today's Africa are significantly different from those of post-war Europe. We are not asking for identical programs and actions. What we seek is an equal firm commitment to partnership. We seek enhanced international cooperation with African nations to achieve the 2030 Agenda and Sustainable Development Goals. There are five points I want to highlight. First, if this year's theme is to have any important at all and any impact, global institutions, other nations, and their private sector actor must see Africa as a development priority, not just for Africa, but in the interests of all old as well. Due to both long-standing internal and external factors, Nigerians and African economic structures have been skewed to impede development, industrial expansion, job creation, and the equitable distribution of wealth. If Nigeria is to fulfill its duty to its people, I know, and the rest of Africa, we must create jobs and the belief in a better future for our people. We are pushing for that. We must also lead by example, and we are doing so to foster economic growth and investors' confidence in Nigeria, I remove the costly and corrupt fuel subsidy while also discarding a nauseous exchange rate system in my first few days in office. Other growth and job-oriented firms are in the wings. I'm mindful of the transient hardship that reform can cause. However, it is necessary to go through this phase in order to establish a foundation for durable growth and investment to build the economy our people deserve. We welcome partnerships 
with those who not mind seeing Nigeria and Africa assume larger roles in the global community. The question is not whether Nigeria is open for business. The question is how much of the world is truly open to doing business with Nigeria and how African is an equal, mutually beneficial manner. Direct investment in critical industries, opening your port to a wider range and larger quantity of African exports, and meaningful debt relief are important aspects of the cooperation we seek. Second, we must affirm democratic governance as the best guarantor of sovereign will and well-being of the people. Military coups are wrong, as in any titled civilian political arrangement that is, we perpetuate injustice. The wave-crossing part of Africa does not demonstrate favor for towards coup. It is a demand for solution to perennial problem. Let us dig it deeper. Regarding Niger, we are negotiating with the military leaders as chairman of ECOWAS. I seek to help establish democratic governance in a manner that addresses the political economy challenges confronting that nation, including violent extremists who seek to foment instability in our region. I send a hand of friendship to all of you who may genuinely support this mission for a democratic governance in that nation. This brings me to my third crucial point. Our entire region is locked in protected by truth against violent extremists. And the turmoil, a dark channel of inhuman commerce has formed. Along the route, everything is for sale. Men, women, and children are seen as chattel. Yet, thousands read the Sahara, hot and sand, and the Mediterranean cold death in search of a better life. At the same time, machineries and extremists with their lethal weapons and vile ideologies invade our region from the north. This harmful traffic undermines the peace and stability of the entire region. African nation will improve our economics so that our people do not risk their life to sweep the floors and streets of other nations. We also shall devote ourselves to disbanding extremist groups on our toes. Yet, to fully contain this threat, the international community must strengthen its commitment to arrest the flow of arms and violent people into West Africa. The fourth important aspect of this global trust and solidarity is to secure the continent's mineral-rich areas from plivering and conflicts. Many such areas have become catacombs of ministry and exploitation. The Democratic Republic of Congo has suffered this for decades, despite the strong UN presence there. What happened? The world economy owes the Republic of Congo much but gives a very little. The mayhem visited on resource-rich areas does not respect national boundaries. Sudan, Mali, Burkina Faso, Central African Republic, 
and the list grow on and on and on. The problem also knock at Nigerians door. Foreign entities abetted by local criminals who aspire to be petty world laws have drafted thousands of people into servitude to illegally mine gold and other resources. Billions of dollars spent to improve the nation's economy now fuel violent enterprises. If left unchecked, they will threaten peace and place national security at a great danger. Given the extent of this injustice and the high scale involved, many Africans are asking whether the phenomenon is by accident or by design. Members nation must reply by working with us to deter their farms and nationals from the 21st century pillage of continent riches. Fifth, climate change severely impact Nigeria and Africa. Northern Nigeria is honored by desert encroachment, hounded from the north. All the arable lands, our south is pounded by the rising tide of coastal flooding and erosion. In the middle, the rainy season brings flood that kill and displace multitudes. As I lament death at home, I also lament the grave loss of life in Morocco and Libya. The Nigerian people are with you. Please note that. African nations will fight climate change, but must do so on fair and just terms. To achieve the need popular consensus, this campaign must accord with overall economic efforts. In Nigeria, we shall build political consensus by highlighting remedial actions which also promote economic good. Projects such as Green Wall to stop desert encroachment halting the destruction of our forest by mass production and dis distribution of gas burning stoves, and providing employment in local water management and irrigation projects are examples of efforts that equally advance both economic and climate change objectives. Continental efforts regarding climate change we register important features if established economies were more forthcoming with public and private sector investment for African preferred initiatives. Again, this will go far in demonstrating that global solidarity is real and working. As I'm about to close, let me emphasize Nigeria's objective accord with the guiding principles of this world body. Peace, security, human rights, and development. In fundamental ways, nature has been kind to Africa. Given abundant land, resources, and creative and industrious people. Man has, too often, man has too often been unkind to follow man, and this sad tendency has brought, uh, brought sustained hardship to Africans' doorstep. To keep faith with the tenets of this world to this body and the theme of this year's assembly, the poverty of nations must end. 
the pilage of one nation's resources by overreach of farms and people of stronger nations must end. They will, the will of the people must be respected. This beautiful, generous, and forgiving planet must be protected. As for Africa, we seek to be neither appendage nor patron. We do not wish to replace old shackles with new ones. Instead, we hope to walk the rich African soil and live under the magnificent African sky, free of the wrongs of the past and clear of the associated encumbrances. We desire a beautiful, prosperous, vibrant, democratic living space for our people. Will we do it? To the rest of the world, I say, work with us as true friends and partners. Africa is not a problem to be avoided, nor is it to be pitied. Africa is nothing less than the key to the world's future. I thank you for listening. de l'Assemblée générale, je tiens à remercier le président et commandant en chef des forces armées de la République fédérale du Nigeria de la locution qui vient de prononcer. Et je prie le protocole de bien. Oh, that was Nigeria's President Bola Tinubu addressing the United Nations uh, General Assembly. Well, for, um, to help us dig deeper into the president's speech. We have uh, the current affairs analyst and professor of communications at Beijing University in Abuja, Professor Abiodun Adini. Uh, good to have you here with us, Professor. Uh, thanks oh, for pleasure. taking the time. Uh, we've been waiting for that speech. It's been a long yeah, time coming. Yeah, yeah. Um, what are the ma your major takeaways from President Tinubu's speech? Well, it's, it's his first speech at the United Nations. And of course, when you have this kind of speech, what you expect is for uh, the president to provide a drone eye view of all subject matters. Um, troubling not just this country, but the sub-region that he presents in Leeds and the African continent as a whole and in relation to um, the global space. I think he did all this, you know, touching on all um, the key elements that are very important. You know, he was emphatic on democracy, the preservation of democracy, and of course, the essay, he highlighted the essence of democracy for sustainable um, development as well. Then he was also emphatic on the question of insecurity, then injustice. Um, injustice um, featured prominently, not just uh, within the African space, but of course in the economic spheres, in the political sphere, injustice between, um, if you like, the center and the periphery, you know, the stronger nations versus the weaker nations, uh, emerging markets where Africa, where Nigeria uh, is key. Then of course, he also mentioned the question of partnership the Africa, Nigeria, West African countries, as the case could be, I should be seen rather as partners, you know, to this Western much more, or even stronger nations that are much more prosperous. You know, they should be embraced as partners, not as nations that should be pitied, you know. Then they emphasize the question of, um, you know, the reduction of uh, the human being, you know, as an object of uh, trafficking, as an object to be, that is, uh, continuously uh, traumatized, you know, for different reasons, and this could be this could be um, stopped or you know improved upon um, if there's greater regard at the level of partnership. You know, so all this featured essentially in the speech. I thought it captured everything that should be captured. Then, what about his body language? Perhaps we should also mention that his body language was not also too bad. You know, he used um, mannerisms to highlight his point to mm. draw home. Um, his messages, you know, mm. he was also somewhat confident, irrespective of um, his, uh, his predilections, he was somewhat confident. Um, you would have expected that being a first um, outing uh, for, for him, 
um, there will have been some, you know, there were concerns, apprehensions that I may not be able to uh, live up to uh, basic expectations. expectations. But I think he, he did, um, you know, he, he's not a bad one, being the first one. And we expect that, you know, things will grow uh, from here. You know, I do not, I can't see in the meantime where he did not touch, you know, all the key elements uh, were touched really. Because if you take out uh, the preservation of democracy, um, if you touch on the question of um, economic growth, if you, if you also highlight, highlight um, the issue of partnership, you know, and of course insecurity, uh, the creation of relevant or uh, right macroeconomic environment, uh, which sometimes may be may not be within our remit in terms of assistance. And do not forget again, he also talked about um, issues around s foreign support uh, from some criminal activities, you know, illegal mining, you know, and the reduction of Africa as to a place just to be pilished, you know, for selfish international gains. You know, he kicked, the, he kicked against this in the speech. So I think it was a rounded speech. He didn't do badly in this right. uh, you, you did. You, you talked about partnership yeah. and economics. Now, the president is also set to meet with the U.S. President Joe yeah. Biden for mm -hmm. further talks. What would this mean for U.S.-Nigeria relations? Well, it means a lot considering the place of the United uh, States in, in, um, in the world. What first is the bastion of democracy, one of the strongest um, economies, if not the strongest in the world until the rise of China, and it's one of the most influential, if not the most influential. Um, there are so many things that we can actually leverage on that we can take advantage of, you know. Uh, but beyond uh, the question of um, meetings on the sidelines of um, the conference, it's also the need for us to see through agreements and MOUs. Um, do not forget that this is not the first time we'll be having a president who is doing this kind of meeting, you know, a meeting um, that will be held with large delegation of key Nigerian officials. Now we've been told that a couple of governors went with him, a couple of ministers went with him. No doubt right moves, you know, uh, but let's see a fruition of the discussions that the president is going to be holding, you know, which means that it shouldn't just be a showpiece for the sake of it. Um, it shouldn't just be an event that will be an end in itself, but an event that will lead, to, that will be a means to an end. And leading to a means to an end just be, means that we should follow up discussions and see to their implementation. Now, Obviously, we'll see an administration that is eager to deliver. Uh, you cannot take that away from this um, Tinubu administration. You can see the eagerness to deliver, um, maybe against bragging of perceptions that um, it's not going to do well. So you can see the passion. The passion is obvious. Yeah. Um, making sure everything is rightly done, trying their best within their own understanding, irrespective of the downsides that we're probably noticing, which is natural anyway. So against the background of this desire, it's also the need for them to follow, through, follow things through. Um, so that it will go beyond um, just talking speeches, uh, to walking the talk. Actual implementation. Yeah, that's and right. Now, now speaking of this, uh, Professor Biona, um, mm -hmm. the U.S. Deputy Treasury Secretary, uh, Dewale Wali, mm -hmm. Adeyemo, has been speaking. He was at the Lagos Business School, and he made a comment, and he's, he's saying that Nigeria lacks uh, a, a macroeconomic framework to mm -hmm. attract uh, foreign direct, mm -hmm. especially dollar-denominated foreign investment into Nigeria, mm -hmm. and Nigeria needs to fix this. Mm -hmm. Just yesterday, yeah. we had another grid collapse in less than yeah. three weeks. Now, yeah. let's, let's, how do you reconcile the president saying that Nigeria is open for business and we're having these little challenges? Uh, I'm not sure we can rest on our OAS, irrespective of uh, our limitations with regards to macroeconomic framework, you know. And this is not the first time that we are hearing it. We know it ourselves. That all the indices are not right. There's a question of insecurity. Um, you know, and of course, it is taken for granted that um, capital will always move away from where there's crisis. Mm -hmm. Capital moves to where there's peace, where there will be return on investment. And the environment now seems not to be right. There's insecurity. We do not, do that. We do, we do not know our numbers. You know, um, there's somewhat some level of instability at the level of uh, polity. And of course, the business environment is also 
um, problematic, you know. Um, there's absence of integrity, absence of transparency, you know, uh, absence of credibility, um, trust, you know. There's a huge trust deficit between the government and the government. So, so much uncertainty. All these things, you know, are inimical, you know, um, to foreign investment. But because they are there, does not mean we should not keep trying. Mm -hmm. And all the investors want to see, probably, um, it's a deliberate effort. What effort is government making uh, towards remedying these downsides? If they see genuine efforts and they can uh, imagine milestones, you know, deliverables, timelines towards the achievement of some of these remedies, I think they, they will be encouraged. But the, the other factor that we should be concerned about is not just essentially uh, foreign investment. There's, there's, quite a lot, there's quite a lot we can do within ourselves, you know, as a people, you know, if we take ourselves seriously and try to enhance um, our environment, you know, try to reduce some of the big elephants in the room, you know, curb corruption, increase transparency, and reduce the exportation of our capital. The bulk of our capital are largely stolen and exported to some of these foreign countries. And they are alive to some of these things, you know. Um, how well are we doing? What, what are we doing, you know, to unlock our potentials by necessarily uh, reducing capital flight? And the capital that is taking flight are not capital that are genuinely earned, that are cap capital that are stolen, stolen from the same government. And, of course, um, the places where these monies are taken to are places where we rather also need uh, help from. Mm. You know, there's a lot of contradiction that these people are seeing, and when they see it, they just regard us as, as some serious people. You know, so if we can have a rethink, some kind of reorientation uh, with governments um, at the leadership, leadership position, I think the narrative will change regarding how we are perceived, and of course, the potentials or the promise for foreign investment can uh, be further. Um, you know, c can again come to the fore much more than uh, we can imagine. Well, that's a good place to leave it, uh, mm -hmm. Professor Abiodun Adeniyi, uh, Professor of Communications at Bayes University in Abuja. Mm -hmm.